Hello, my name is Richard. I'm the pastor at the King's Church in Adelston in Surrey. And today you've got a bonus episode, a uh, Sermon on the Mount spin-off, if you like. Um, I'm going to be talking about fasting, um, which is something that has come up through uh, Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, but it's not actually exactly from the sermon itself. Uh, you may remember Jesus said, when you fast, and then he carries on and he basically says uh, that your fasting be something that's between you and God, not something that is a show for everybody else to see. Um, and so there's this idea that our fasting is uh, part of our secret life, if you like, with God. Um, but Jesus says, when you fast. And so the assumption is that we all fast, not Here's an idea about fasting that maybe you should try. But the, the assumption is that everybody fasts. And so then Jesus teaches on how you should fast when you do fast. Um, so I've been asked to teach on fasting because in our culture, in our Christian tradition, fasting isn't really that common. It's not something we really talk an awful lot about. I don't think it's necessarily something that we put into practice a lot um, regularly anyway. So um, fasting. Okay, if you go through scripture and um, fasting, you'll see connections with fasting with um, when people are seeking guidance from God, uh, when they're seeking God's direction, you'll see fasting is connected with that sometimes. Um, when people are repenting, uh, you'll see fasting connected with that sometimes. Uh, when people are mourning or lamenting, you'll see fasting connected with that. When people are really earnest in their prayer, uh, often fasting accompanies that. Um, sometimes there are uh, calls to, to get together and fast together, to seek God together. That's off. Sometimes um, you'll find that in the Bible. Um, sometimes you'll see that uh, fasting is connected with justice. Um, and we'll pick that up another time. Um, but within the scripture, there is, I don't know, a little direction on why we actually fast. It's just assumed you fast in those kind of situations that I've just mentioned. Um, and so sometimes that assumption of the scripture leaves us in the modern Western world a little mystified. So anyway, today I'm going to te um, base today's teaching on uh, Jesus's model of fasting, which you can find in Matthew chapter 4. Um, Matthew chapter 4, uh, just prior to that in chapter 3, uh, Jesus has just been baptised and the Holy Spirit has come upon him. God has said, this is uh, my son whom I love. Um, and just after that, straight away, the beginning of chapter 4, we find this happens. It says this, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And then the, the story goes on to, to speak of how the devil tempts Jesus with um, trying to get him to turn stones into bread, um, trying to get him to get angels to come and help him, um, trying to get him to bow down and worship Satan himself. Um, and those are the temptations Jesus faces in the wilderness as he's fasting. Now, if I knew I was going to go into a, a lonely desert place, um, to face the devil and his temptations. Um, if I knew that, my inclination would be to pack a big bag full of food and supplies and equipment, um, some sandwiches and a flask of some drink or something, and go head on into the situation like that, because I know that I need to be at the top of my game to overcome the devil and whatever his temptations may be. I, I would know that I would need to be strong and have everything about me to even stand a chance. But Jesus doesn't do that. Um, instead, he enters this battle with temptation and evil on an empty stomach. And maybe that speaks of something of where Jesus draws his strength from. Not from himself and the resources he can find in this material world, but from the words of the Father and from the Holy Spirit. And maybe this also speaks of the, where the battle really lies. Um, of overcoming the power and the urges that come from within, the temptations to evil that come from inside us. And if so, I think through Jesus we can see that fasting is part of a spiritual struggle over evil. 
Now, as I was thinking about this, I was reminded um, of a story uh, my pastor uh, from my previous church, Alan, uh, would tell from time to time. And hello, Alan, if you're watching. Um, and it is of a time when the, the US government um, called leaders to pray and fast for a day. Um, that happens from time to time in, in governments around the world. Um, and there was a young congressman um, who was not a believer in God, and he'd never deprived himself before. Um, I don't know, maybe he came from a, a privileged background and really just had always had what he needed. Um, but nevertheless, even though he wasn't a believer, um, and therefore, I guess, wasn't really believing in the prayer, he decided to join in the fast for the day. And by the end of the day, he was aware that his body was angry. Even though his mind and his, his consciousness was at peace, he realised that his body was just angry and really speaking, <laughs> speaking to him. And that really disturbed him to find that his body seemed to have a will of its own. So rather than give in to his body and its will, this congressman decided to uh, fast another day, to force his body into submission. Um, and so it's, uh, that fasting that he, he, he went through revealed something to him and speaks to us of the struggles that lie within all of us. And it causes us, as it probably asked this guy, to ask the question, who's really in control? Now, the Bible describes this struggle like this. In Romans chapter 7, Paul, the, the, the writer of Romans, describes the struggle like this. He says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good, as it is no longer I myself who do it, but it's the sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. And so Paul is describing this inner battle with something inside him that is doing what he doesn't want to do. He speaks elsewhere in Galatians saying this, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You see, the New Testament describes this thing inside us, the flesh, the sinful nature it's known as in the scriptures, that works inside us. It's the root of passions and desires that are evil and not of God. It's the source of selfish, the selfish self, let's put it that way. The thing inside us that cries out, me, I want, I need. I must. And if you doubt that you have that inside you, then just deprive yourself of food for any considerable time and listen to what your body has to say to you. Listen to what your body says. Because we're unified beings. Our physical bodies are completely intertwined with our mind and our spirit and our soul, whether we realise it or not. Fasting is a physical act that actually works um, in our spirit and in all kinds of ways in us as well as our body. See, fasting is a putting to death of the me, the my needs, the my will, the my desire. It's a way of crucifying the flesh with its passions and its desires, as Paul puts it. There's a guy from the fourth century, a, a church father called Evagrius. He said this, fasting is a means of killing the desires and passions of the body, which is probably why fasting is often connected with praying for God's guidance and seeking his will and, and repentance. So fasting is a practice of denying the flesh. It's a way of freedom and renewal in the Holy Spirit, saying no to my desires and yes to God. It's what God sees 
in secret and rewards in secret. And I think that's a big deal for us in the modern world, isn't it? Fasting goes against the grain of the culture that we live in. We're taught to be consumers. We're told to satisfy cravings. For food, that's a comfort giver for us. It's what we go to to numb the reality of the world that we live in. We treat ourselves because we feel we deserve it. I know me through lockdown that I've I began to eat more than I would normally, than I needed to. Probably as a, a comfort mechanism um, and also just working from home, food's just there. So it's just easy just to pick it up and put it in your mouth. Become a bit of a habit. It's a habit we can justify quite well, isn't it? Because we need food to survive, so we, we do need to eat. John Cassian, another church father from the 4th century, said this, Food is to be taken in so far as it supports our life, but not to the extent of enslaving us to the impulses of desires. To eat moderately and reasonably is to keep the body in health, not to deprive it of holiness. See, the early church fathers, they can be quite practical when it comes to giving advice on how to fast and other spiritual practices. And so again, John Cassian says this, The Holy Fathers have not given us only a single rule for fasting, or a single standard, or a measure for eating, because not everyone has the same strength. Age, illness, or delicacy of body create differences. But they have given us all a single goal, to avoid overeating and filling our bellies. They also found that a day's fast to be more beneficial and greater help towards purity than one extending over a period of three, or four, or even seven days. Someone who fasts too long, they say, often ends up eating too much food. The result is that at times the body becomes drained of vitality through lack of food and sluggish over its spiritual exercises, while at other times, weighed down by the mass of food it has eaten. It makes the soul listless and slack. So what he's saying is, when it comes to fasting, it's not one size fits all. It's not a spiritual endurance competition either, where we compare ourselves with other people. It's not swinging from extremes of starvation to gorging ourselves so we're completely stuffed. But it's moderation that is good for our body, for our soul and for our spirit. It's an intentional denying of self. Not skipping lunch because we were too busy anyway, that's not really fasting. It's not abstaining from foods that we don't really like anyway. Like for me, having a whole year without sprouts, that's not a hardship for me. It's not eating because we want to lose, that, lose weight. Um, that's not fasting. I'd say if you want to grow in spirit, the spiritual practice of fasting, then start small. Some, start with something that's achievable and something that you can grow from if needs be. Invite the Holy Spirit in to your fast. Allow God to be involved in your fast. You're not trying to impress God or to gain his favour through fasting. It's something to be done with him. Our fasting should be proportionate to our personal situation. And this is really, really important. You know, if you have diabetes or some kind of medical condition where you need to keep your, your diet balanced and, and, and right, then don't do things through fasting that are going to be harmful to you. God is not interested in you trying to beat yourself up uh, through fasting or endanger yourself through fasting. Um, so just be, be sensible in what you can do and what you can do. Don't compare yourself with others. It's not something that we do as a competition. Um, oh, they're fasting for a day. I'm going to see if I can fast for two days. No, this is something we do in secret between us and God. So you could maybe skip a meal in a day or decide to fast for a whole day. Uh, or you could abstain from certain types of foods. You could maybe have a period where you, you don't have any meat or you don't have any sweet things. Something that you would normally desire though and crave after. You could make uh, a, maybe a partial fast where you don't uh, eat food but you do allow yourself drinks such as tea and coffee and, and things like that. I'd suggest you always um, allow yourself to have water. Why would we want to do this? Well, we just want to grow in Christ-like self-denial. That's, that's the aim, uh, to grow in holiness, to grow in prayer, to grow in purity, to, gr to grow in Jesus at the end of the day. And that takes patience, uh, it takes practice, it takes perseverance. 
But I'm wondering, could we commit as a community uh, to start putting this into practice? Uh, to, to commit to developing uh, these spiritual disciplines together, to, to learn together, to encourage one another, to find out together what we're learning from putting fasting into practice. Um, I think this kind of spiritual discipline works really well when we do it together as a community. And you may think, well, Jesus says, yeah, you should do this in secret. Yes, he does, but the whole point for that is so that we wouldn't be showing off with what we're doing. But if we can support one another and encourage one another and learn from one another as we are uh, practicing our fasting, then I think that's only a good thing. So let us consider as a community how we can grow in the practice of fasting. And let's just see where it goes and how that may change us and shape us. I'm going to finish by reading uh, Jesus' words on fasting from the Sermon on the Mount. When you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that you will not be, it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Grace and peace to you, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this video and appreciate it, then please do give it a like um, uh, uh, and, and, and give us a comment. Um, particularly if you're wanting to um, develop your practice of fasting, then get in touch. Um, we'd love to better walk together uh, in doing that and growing in that practice. So until next time, God bless.